So we pray, Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Thank you uh, for showing us a little bit of what heaven's like, just that tangible presence. Uh, we just invite you more and more, Holy Spirit, to be, to be part of this church family and its mission and to equip us and all that you do. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would open our, our, our hearts, that you would soften our hearts and any crust around our hearts. We pray that that, that would fall away um, and that we would surrender and be vulnerable to you. Amen. So this, um, uh, this, this, this chap um, went to A&E, and um, so he went into A&E, and he went up um, to reception, and the receptionist um, asked him, uh, you know, how can I help? And she said, uh, shingles. So she took some details, etc., and said, well, have a seat, and someone will come and see you. So he sat down for about 40 minutes, and then um, the trauma nurse came out, took him into the room and said, uh, what's the problem? He said, shingles. And so she, she said, oh, well, someone will come and see you in a little while, go and have a seat. And then the auxiliary nurse came out, took him in the queue, said, um, what's the problem? He said, shingles. And so she weighed him and uh, did his height and blood pressure and everything. So go have another seat. He was out there another 40 minutes. And then the doctor and nurse came and got him. And they went to a cubicle, cubicle and they said, um, what's the problem? He said, shingles. So I said, well, take all your clothes off. And um, so the doctor said, well, well, where are they? He said, outside in the lorry. <laughs> it's a lorry, it's a delivery of shingles. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, okay, so um, sometimes we don't see the... Uh, some of you, wow, there's different speeds here, isn't there? <laughs> different speeds here. Um, um, well, you, sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees, can you? And people can't see the wood for the trees. Um, anyway, there was... Um, um, uh, there was a, 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 in Canada, there was this um, North American Indian, and he was lying in a row with his, his, his ear to the ground, and this gentleman came up to him and said, Whoa, well, what are you doing? He said, uh, blue van. Oh, wow, that's amazing. He said, 80 miles an hour. Well, that's an amazing skill. And he said, white man, uh, dog in passenger seat. He said, that's a fantastic skill. And the, the, the the engine first said, no, it's, n it's not a skill, I've just been run over. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you can't see the wood for the trees sometimes, can you? Huh? You really can't see the wood for the trees. But, but, but today, um, we, I, I want to help us, actually we can, and I want to start off um, with a, a, a reading, just a reading from Hebrews 4.12, and this is what it says. You see, it focuses us, it's specific, and uh, we can see the wood for the trees uh, through the gospel message and the truth of the gospel. And it says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, that's not seeing the wood for the trees. That's specific, isn't it? Eh? For the word... The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's words, our Father's words, our Father's words in our Bible reading today come from the letter called Romans. And many of us are, are learning a lot about the letter um, from the, this letter of Romans from the Simon Ponsonby book, um, unpacking um, some of the teaching from Romans. Now, Paul the Apostle wrote this letter, this letter of Romans, in about AD 57, around 17 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. 17 years. That's all. 70 year, 17 years after the crucifixion, his crucifixion, and 17 years after his resurrection. And Paul clearly sets out the foundations of the Christian faith in this letter. And the foundations, the foundations being, all people are sinful, Christ died to forgive sin, we, you and me, are made right with God through faith. 
This faith begins a new life with a relationship with God. And like a sports team that constantly, a sports team that constantly reviews the basics, we are greatly helped, we're greatly helped out in our faith by keeping close to these foundations. By reading this letter, Romans, we will never be at a loss to know what we should believe. And Paul gives clear and practical guidelines for the believers in Rome and everywhere. The Christian faith, he teaches, is not an abstract theology unconnected to our lives. But it will have pr practical implications that will affect us on how we choose to behave and live each day. It is not enough to know the gospel. That's not enough. We are called to let the words of the gospel transform our lives and let God impact every aspect of our lives. The, trans the transformation of our lives is the changing from our old nature into our new nature in Christ. The foundation Paul teaches us is this transformation. Uh, and this is your calling. <laughs> this is our calling. Death to Adam and life through Christ. Death to our old nature and life to our new nature in Christ. And this is what I want to explore um, and the implications, or should I say, the call of grace on you and me. This is what I want to explore in my sharing today. The call of grace on you and on me. To die to works and be transformed into being grace. Being grace. Ontologically being grace. That you are grace. That I am grace. That is our very being. So what are we being called to? What are we being called to? Prophecy. This is a word for St. Helen's parish. As a unit, the Lord has shown me a picture of a book and the book has been open on the same page for a long time. The same ways and routines have been followed for a long time. The Lord then said, I want to change your church, your way of doing things. I want to change your stability. I'm not bringing chaos, but bringing new things. Gina was then led to a scripture in Lamentations 3, where everything appeared dark every day. Things were terrible, awful. But then God said he was bringing new mercies every day. So Gina felt that God wanted to change the page, make everything new, give new mercies, and a new calling for the church. Turn the page, if you like. Gina said there would be a new release of healing gifts. And this was part of the new thing coming to St. Helen's Parish. And this would even include seeing people raised from the dead, an indication of power. She concluded by declaring from the Lord that there would be a new wave of the Spirit, a new stage of the Holy Spirit, something you haven't seen before, a higher calling, a glory calling. The Lord wants to anoint each one with a new gift. Everyone will be used by the Lord. No one is insignificant and the Lord wants no one to be left behind. 15th of June, 2008. In our Romans reading today, Paul is presenting the good news. Salvation is available to all who have faith in him. He is sharing with us that we are saved by grace 
an unearned, undeserved favor from God through faith and a complete trust in Christ and a trust in his finished works, the finished works of the cross, through him we can stand before God, you and I can stand before God and we're not guilty. We are not guilty. We don't earn this, we trust him. That's all. That's all, we trust him. And with this understanding, what does turning the page mean? What does turning the page mean for us? It is a prophetic question for you. It is a personal prophetic question for each person here. It is a prophetic question for our church family and for this parish. Abraham was justified by faith, not works. God desires dependence, trust and faith in him. Not faith in our ability to please him. God's plan from the beginning has been to make himself known to his people. What does turning the page mean? Abraham had, a, had to make a choice. Would he turn the page of the season he was in and open the door to the new season God had planned for him? We all know that there are consequences to any, any action we take. What we do can set into motion a series of events that continue long after we're gone. Unfortunately, when we are making a decision, most of us think only of the immediate consequences. And they are often misleading because they are short-lived. Abraham had a choice to make. We, we have a choice to make. His decision was between setting out with his family for places unknown or, or staying right where he was. He had to decide between the security of what he already had and the uncertainty of traveling under God's direction. All he had to go on was God's promise and prophecy to guide and bless him. That's all Abraham had to go on. That was it. Abraham would, would, would have found it very difficult to visualize how much of the future was resting on his decision of whether to go or stay. What does turning the page mean for us? Abraham's decision and obedience affected the history of the whole world. Our decision, both personally and as a church family, will affect God's ministry in this parish, Hastings and the region. Abraham's decision to follow God set into motion the development of a nation which would be used for the Christ to come into. When Christ came to earth, God's promises were fulfilled. Through Abraham, the whole world was blessed. Through you and through me, or Hastings and the region are to be blessed to be blessed by you, by me. You and myself probably don't know the long-term effects of most of our decisions we make now. But the fact is, there will be long-term results which should cause us to think carefully and to seek God's guidance as we make choices as individuals and as a church family today. We have been called to turn the page. 
This is a calling upon us. Abraham was justified by faith. I want to prophesy over you. St. Helen's Parish, St. Helen's Church family, we are called to turn the page as an individual and as a family. Imagine there is a power that lies hidden at the very heart of God's people. Imagine that. That's you. Th that's you. There is a power hidden in God's people. Suppose this power was built into the initiating stem cell of our church family by the Holy Spirit but is somehow buried and lost or, or, or not being used. Perhaps it has been, a, been lost for a season. Imagine if we rediscovered this hidden power. Imagine that if we rediscovered this hidden power and under God's beautiful grace unleashed it unleashed it surely this is something we who love God who love his people who love his cause would give just about anything to recover the latent inbuilt missional potency this is not a fantasy Indeed, it is a force that lies latent in every Jesus community and every true believer. Not only does this potential exist, it is clearly an identifiable phenomenon that has energized history's revivals and renewals. And this extraordinary power is waiting to be discovered within you within this church family's mission but not without a significant challenge to the status quo and the challenge of turning the page the truth is that the 21st century is turning out to be a highly complex phenomenon where terrorism, technological innovation, an unsustainable environment, rampant consumerism, change and dangerous ideologies confront us. They confront you and me at every point of our lives on a daily basis. In the face of this, we need to be honest and admit that the church as we know it faces a significant adaptive challenge. Church leaders are very aware of the difficulty for their communities to negotiate increasing complexities in which you live. Leaders really are aware of the complexities of what, that we all live in and the tensions of that. The result is there is a decline, a massive decline of the church communities in the West. Therefore, in this situation, this situation you and I are in, we have to ask ourselves probing questions. Will more of the same do the trick? Will more of the same do the trick? Do we have the resources to deal with this situation? What are the resources to deal with this situation? Can we simply rework that what we do? A little tweak here or there? 
Will, will that do it? Will that come up with the, the winning formula? Will that come up with the willing formula? The winning formula? I'm not sure this will be enough. I'm really not. We need a new paradigm shift. A new paradigm shift. A new vision. A new reality. A fundamental change in our thoughts, perceptions and values. Especially as we pray for renewal and revival. As we hope for those things. And it is not reaching into our past for the solution. It is not reaching into our past for the solution. Past glory. Past glory days as great as they were. Doing this, reaching into the past, leads to a retreat to safety and to the familiar and to comforting control of what we know. To being comfortable. More of the same, if you like. More of the same. What we need, what we, we need is courage. <laughs> And we need to trust in our Father. Courage and trust in our Father. If we don't, will we be here in ten years time? Or should I say, who will be left? The question is, what does it mean to be Jesus' people today? Of course the answer is Jesus. And the answer is that we re-engage at the deepest level in the power of the Holy Spirit which lies latent in each one of you, in each one of us. The power of the Holy Spirit which lies latent in all of us here. This is how we begin to turn the page. A new paradigm. It won't be doing church. It will be all of us in our lives, in our daily living, and when we meet together in His name, living in the foundation of a consistent, dynamic, supernatural life. A supernatural life. So what is this? First, for each one of us, we must enjoy friendship with Jesus. When we know who He is, we know who we are. When we know who we are, we become confident carriers of the kingdom, His kingdom. We are called to walk in supernatural power. Not by, by our works, not by a list of principles, but by our friendship with Jesus. Not a friendship based on ulterior motives. Let's say to see miracles for miracles' sake. Although miracles are a byproduct of a life totally consumed with Jesus. Walking in signs, wonders and miracles is not just a matter of us in Christ, but Christ in us. If Jesus lives, lives inside of us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, it is necessary that we understand who He is, what He desires, what He can do, and what his plans are. We will represent Jesus accurately. To the level that we enjoy an intimate relationship with him. The less fellowship we enjoy with Jesus. The more likely we will inaccurately display his character. And his nature. Principles or person. Works or grace. Miracles are exciting, but they fail to satisfy our hungry hearts unless 
we embrace them for what they are. They, miracles, are invitations to see the personality and nature of Jesus in action. They invite us to visibly see who God is and what he is like. The miracle points to a greater reality, the person of Jesus. That's what miracles point to, the person of Jesus. Miracles bring God near. They remind us that God is not distant and detached, but he is present, near, and ever ready to invade impossible situations in our lives. What seems impossible are not impossible for him. You know that many times in our lives, um, you know, uh, situations are just so dire, no way out, and a miracle has happened. Oh, miracles. Absolutely. The impossible becomes possible. If you're in a place now and you think it's just impossible, it is possible with Jesus. Your miracle is possible. Miracles reveal the compassion, the compassionate heart of God. Is that not what a miracle is? The compassionate heart of God? And when we come to worship Jesus, we are all at his feet. We are all on the same ground. And Jesus is exalted and lifted up. Laying at his feet is resting in his love. This is our call. This is our turn in the page. This, the greatest supernatural exploits will not come about by those who pursue principles. They will be made manifest by those who enjoy Jesus and cherish his very presence. With the presence of his grace in you and in these meetings, a generation, a people out, a people out there will become lovesick for Jesus. The miraculous is a supernatural byproduct of this intimacy and enjoyment of his presence. The miraculous healings, the miraculous, the miraculous anointing is a supernatural byproduct of his intimacy and enjoyment of, of, of his presence. Let's rest in his presence to allow his ministry and his miracles and his signs and wonders and turn the page together into this new and anointed season. This is a word for St. Helen's Parish as a unit. The Lord has shown me a picture of a book and the book has been open on the same page for a long time. The same ways and routines have been followed for a long time. The Lord then said, I want to change your church, your way of doing things. I want to change your stability. I'm not bringing chaos, but bringing new things. Gina was then led to a scripture in Lamentations 3, where everything appeared dark every day. Things were terrible awful but then God said he was bringing new mercies every day so Gina felt that God wanted to change the page make everything new give new mercies and a new calling for the church turn the page if you like Gina said there would be a new release of healing gifts and this was part of the new thing coming to St. Helen's parish and this would even include seeing people raised from the dead an indication of power. She concluded by declaring from the Lord that there would be a new wave of the Spirit, a new stage of the Holy Spirit, something you haven't seen before, a higher calling, a glory calling. The Lord wants to anoint each one with a new gift. Everyone will be used 
by the Lord. No one is insignificant and the Lord wants no one to be left behind. 15th of June, 2008. Amen.